Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today I have my friend Stefan, aka Space Hoon, on to help, uh, I guess, appreciate the project I'm going to show off today. Stefan, thank you for joining us, and uh, aren't you excited to find out what I have to show you? Hello, yes, I have no clue what this is about. So, <laughs> yeah. Right, so I have asked Stefan on today because he is, uh, if not one of the best, then certainly my favorite um, security researcher specializing in microcontrollers, specifically the ESP8266. I don't know if someone's going to get mad if I say that you're the very best, Stefan, but I think you're the best. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure if I would agree with that, but I'll take it. Yeah, so this project actually uses your very most favorite, or okay, maybe not very most favorite, your very most used microcontroller, the ESP8266. And you and I have for a long time used these devices both as a platform and also as a way to educate people about how Wi-Fi security works. And we've even made a couple of um, hacking games using this cool little microcontroller, didn't we, Stefan? Oh yeah, the Chicken Man game. <laughs> we made the Chicken Man game, and then also, oh my gosh, I think two years ago duel. at RSA, we made the Wi-Fi Duel. So the Wi-Fi Duel was a game where people would actually, uh, so we had two ESP8266s, which are these little microcontrollers that have Wi-Fi built in. We made one of them an access point, and we made one of them uh, a client. So the client would just join the access point every like five or 10 seconds and generate a Wi-Fi handshake. Now, we had uh, contestants then use a Raspberry Pi running Kali Linux, um, sniff that handshake, capture it, and then crack the password in order to win the game. And it was really fun. Everyone uh, really enjoyed it. And the key of what we did there was making it so you could connect a computer and send uh, a Wi-Fi network name and password really, really easily to continually change the password so we could reset the game. So if you are somebody who wants to show people how easy it is to hack simple Wi-Fi passwords, this game is super easy. You just take two ESPs, you connect them together so they can basically talk to each other with a couple of wires, or you can just use a, a piece of perf board like I did. And then from that, you can easily set those networks to be any password you want and supply people with a password cracking list that includes that password somewhere in there. And boom, you get a game where people can learn about brute forcing Wi-Fi passwords and how easy it is to go up against uh, Wi-Fi networks that have really bad, simple passwords. So I thought it was really fun. And Stefan, a uh, lot of credit to you for making that so simple and also doing it on such a short turnaround. Yeah, I mean, this was pretty cool. And um, you, the people at the conference, I remember, had a lot of fun too. I mean, this was quite a success. Yeah, because these were like marketing people and sales people that don't usually get to, you know, get their hands dirty hacking. And we actually got to teach them how real security works. And they, uh, you know, in a, a safe and controlled environment, got to do something that they usually only hear hackers, you know, uh, doing. So they got to like hack their first Wi-Fi network, get the password and realize like, oh, this is how like my home router works too. Like that wasn't very hard. Maybe I should change it to be more difficult. So, um, you know, we've we've been look, looking to make these sorts of games for people to learn about Wi-Fi security using this awesome little microcontroller and basically make it as simple as possible. You know, we did another game where we had uh, this just sending out a captured handshake over and over and over. So it, what was cool about that is this little device was pretending to be two devices at the same time. We recorded the traffic of you know, an access point with the client joining it and had this little microcontroller just play out each one of those um, captured uh, pieces of traffic. And to anybody who's using Wireshark or, or Wireshark or scanning, it looks like a Wi-Fi password, which you can actually capture and crack. So if you just want to practice uh, cracking a single Wi-Fi handshake, then there's actually a sketch that Stefan and I came up with. Uh, this was my idea that I kept insisting to him uh, at C3, like, hey, like, do you think we could just like record traffic and like play it back and make it look like there's two devices when there's only one? So for like $3, if you want to try, uh, you know, cracking a handshake, then you can absolutely do this. The only disadvantage to this is it's really annoying to change the password to a different password. So it's pretty much the one that's baked in when you flash it. And if you want to set it to a different one, then you have to reflash 
reflash this little device, which is, you know, kind of annoying right now. Of course, if there was a way to reflash this device really easily from like, I don't know, like a web interface or something, then I'm sure it would be a lot more convenient to swap things out and play a game like that. But, you know, maybe sometime in the future. Who knows if that's even possible, right, Stefan? Yeah. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <Maybe something. laughs> We're looking at. Yeah. So, um, so all right. So those are a couple of different games that we, uh, Stefan and I, have made for the community just based on this cool little microcontroller. And um, today, I want to propose to Stefan that maybe in our future games we can include something that allows people to take the next step in what an attacker would typically do. So if you are a hacker and you break into a Wi-Fi network, odds are uh, you're going to look around and see what else is there. Now, when a hacker first joins the Wi-Fi network and is assigned an IP address, they basically also get the keys to see traffic that's going around, to see other devices on the network, and also interact with those devices. Unless there's specific security mechanisms put in place the, that make it so devices on the same network cannot talk to each other. So in this case, wouldn't it be cool if as soon as you broke into the Wi-Fi network, you were able to connect to it and find something really juicy on that network? So in this case, um, there's actually a way to make this ESP8266 look like a uh, kind of like a network attached storage server, which has FTP enabled. So if I'm an attacker and I find this on the network, this will just automatically connect to the Wi-Fi network you program it to connect to. Um, let's say that it's your home network, Stefan, uh, and we have this connected to your home access point, and it's just sitting there. And theoretically, nobody should ever connect to this device. It looks like something that an attacker would be looking for, a poorly secured storage server that might have all sorts of valuable information, maybe financial information, maybe uh, you know whatever it is. Uh, it looks like could possibly be living on this very poorly secured server. And you're never going to access this because you know that it's fake and there's nothing on it, which actually, by the way, Stefan, if you access the uh, spiffs memory on this, then you can upload files to make it look like there are files hosted on this FTP server, which is really cool. Um, so this thing would sit, and if, uh, if an attacker used Wi-Fi cracking to somehow get Stefan's Wi-Fi password and then joined his network, they would look around and try to find something that was really easy to attack. Uh, now, of course, they would find like maybe like I don't know, like an iPhone or, or something else that like maybe you could mess with that if you redirect the user and try phishing them or something. Or you could find services like SSH, FTP, or Telnet. Now those three services will generally allow you to get access to a device and start doing stuff. Uh, you can try to log into other services. You can try to start reconfiguring the device. But it's really attractive to a hacker to try to log into these services and see what is there. Now, in the best case scenario for a hacker, the person will be like, oh, I'm on my home network. Like, I'm not even going to change the default password of this device. It happens a lot. And even if they do change the default password, maybe they make it really simple, or maybe they make it the same password as they set for the Wi-Fi network itself. This is also extremely common. So what you'll see is the attacker will break in. They'll find something like an FTP server that they can try to brute force. And then they'll just try to break into it and see whether or not the person was lazy enough to not secure this device since it's on their home network. It's, it's supposedly safe. If they get access to this, then this little device will immediately send a message to a, uh, well, it'll send a message to a Canary Token server, which will then fire off an alert to your email and also track the, uh, the IP address of the device that tried to initiate the connection. So if I'm uh, Stefan and, and suddenly I get an email that says, somebody just accessed the forbidden FTP server, it means that someone has run a brute forcing attack and has found the correct password. So this is act an active sign of an attack and then has uh, logged into the FTP server. So because Stefan would never do that by accident, he knows that there's an, an attacker on his network looking for the easiest thing to attack. And while it seems like they found something, in fact, they've uh, accessed a honeypot. So this whole thing was kind of initiated by an email I got from uh, David Gibson at Verona, someone I work with. And uh, he was like, hey, I used to work with Raspberry Pis uh, doing honeypot stuff. Is that still something that's really easy? Is that still something people can do? And the answer was kind of um, sort of. 
Like there's not a lot of very well documented projects that uh, allow a beginner to set up a honeypot and then actually get to see what happens. There are some projects where you set up a honeypot and it, it like sends the information back to some other person's project. Um, and you know, this will be like some big company that does like attack analytics and you're basically just helping them um, accrue intelligence on what sort of attacks are taking place. But it's not like the old like Kippo or Calry honeypots that allow you to just kind of like watch somebody get stuck in the server. And some of these were also very devious where they would like, you would send like give it a Linux command and it would return random output or just fail or cause a segmentation fault for no reason at all. So it was kind of designed to like just actually frustrate people that broke into uh, the uh, honeypot and also look to see like what kind of malware are they dropping? Like what kinds of, of things are people doing to these servers that are out there and vulnerable, um, just so you know how better to protect your own devices. You don't really get that benefit anymore because most of the honeypots that allow you to do this sort of thing are either very poorly documented or assume you're already an expert. So while I did a quick look at all these different honeypot resources, I wasn't really able to find a ton of them that were really good. So actually, if we wanna switch over to my screen, I did find a GitHub repository that's dedicated to just showing um, awesome honeypots. So different um, honeypot resources for people who want to get into this for free, um, a curated list of awesome honeypots plus related components and much more. So. When I went through this list, I looked at the ones that seemed really simple to set up. And a lot of these were kind of either very old uh, or just projects that require you to do a lot more than the average beginner might want to do in order to just get some basic indication that, hey, somebody's rooting around my network. When I think about a honeypot, I kind of think about like, you know, something that looks really attractive to an attacker and when access will trigger an alert. Like that's the most basic kind of definition in my head to a honeypot. And if I can make it look like one of the things that will be really high on attack on an attacker's list of things they're looking for, especially an FTP server, then, or an, an SSH server, that would be perfect. And Stefan, I think I even asked you like a year ago or so, whether or not it was possible to emulate like SSH on an ESP8266, did I not? Oh, I, I can't remember. Yeah, I well when we is were it, creating, is it possible? <laughs> I don't even know, but I wasn't thinking of. I was thinking like Telnet and uh, you know SSH, but I really maybe just should have been thinking FTP because really the whole goal here is to make it so that um, we are able to get uh, like the the feeling of somebody rooting around a network and then hitting one of these tripwires, and that's really what it is. It's a tripwire designed to attract someone's attention by looking like a really valuable thing. Um, so what's cool is, you know, after going through this list and you guys can, can take a look and see, uh, that this game has really kind of leveled up. There's, there's now, um, like honeypot detectors that are like add-ons for like your script to basically <laughs> wow. avoid falling into one of these honeypots. Uh, there's also some, some interesting stuff that's been done, um, I think it was by uh, Wolfgang's channel or something like that, uh, that was showing off a honeypot that just wastes people's time because it like as soon as they attempt to brute force it, it just like delays the script in a way that doesn't trigger the script to fail. It just causes the script to hang for uh, an indefinite period of time and prevents them from using their cracking resources on other devices, which was mm. actually kind of cool. It's mod. Um, yeah, so I like that idea, but it wasn't exactly what I was looking for because it doesn't really warn you when someone's attacking your home network or something. It just, you know, it's just an annoying thing you can put on the internet to, to irritate attackers, which, uh, you know, is really cool. Um, but what I did find was there's a couple of videos by another maker, um, and this channel went through two different honeypots that actually are super well documented and use really low cost hardware. Uh, so ironically, it's also by uh, Thinks Canary, who we have had on the show a number of times because they're actually just super cool. Like they have a million crazy stories for like how their uh, their free uh, honey, or not honey pots, uh, canary tokens, which are a type of honey pot, uh, have been used in creative and different ways. So this is just one of the latest ways I've seen just this very simple concept of a link that triggers uh, when you go to it uh, be used. Now, this is what they kind of did. There's two different ways you can do this, and one of them is using a Raspberry Pi. You can set up something that looks like it has all sorts of services running on it, and then customize the way it alerts you when an attacker joins your network and then you know uh, tries to log into one of these services or attempts to access it. 
Um, and I think it even uh, it does more advanced stuff like telling you like what passwords they're trying when they're trying to like brute force it. It can give you good information about what kinds of password lists people are using. And also just um, is a really good setup that you can put on your own personal network that's not gonna really cost you anything. Um, except for the cost of a Raspberry Pi, that is. You know, but you don't need to do anything besides put this thing on your network and kick back and wait. But then I saw that they followed up with another video using an ESP8266 or an ESP32. And the way they did this was also really, really community friendly. They just made it a Arduino library. So it comes with an example sketch, and all you need to do to start using this on your own uh, like D1 Mini or other ESP8266 is just basically install this, um, this library into Arduino IDE, and you can flash the example sketch with a couple basic modifications, and you're done. That's it. Um, so yeah, I was really impressed by this because I thought like, if you and I in the future could integrate something like this into one of the Wi-Fi games we've already done, it adds a whole new level where um, because you can host read-only uh, FTP files within the, the fake FTP server, you can actually make it so people can find a flag when they get the correct password and log in. So I kind of, I like that because you can also verify that someone's logged in uh, and successfully managed to uh, get into the server by it sending off the canary token. So as soon as it's accessed, it lets you know the IP address of the person who accessed it. And that can also let you know who won the game. So, you know, as soon as you get that email, you're basically, all right, someone has broken in, like whose IP address is this? And that person raises their hand and that's the person that won the little Wi-Fi hacking slash service hacking game. So. I like that it gives two different layers of brute forcing. One of them is the offline attack and the other is the online attack. Stefan, you want to explain the difference between those? I have a deja vu here. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Um, so offline tracking is when you capture, in, if we're talking about Wi-Fi, that would be capturing the um, four-way handshake. So the few packets that are exchanged when a client logs into a network. They exchange keys and everything, and this uh, exchange is encrypted, but you can capture that. And then um, if you have the SSID of the network, which you can just read out of the packets, um, then you can take a password list, uh, hash the passwords together with the SSID. You get um, another yeah, encrypted uh, piece of data, and then you check if that encrypted data equals to the packets that you captured. If they do, you found the password. And mm -hmm. so the nice mm -hmm. thing about offline cracking is that um, you have to capture that exchange once, and then you can um, try cracking it as long as you like. So you can um, go crazy. There's no one that can keep you from uh, cracking it anymore because you have, it runs offline. You don't need any connection. You don't send anything actively to anyone. And that's a difference because on online, um, online active, what's the word? Uh, online. Is it online, uh, online cracking? Sounds weird. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you send active packets to the target. So you would um, actively try um, sending a message to the server or whatever you're trying to get into hey, um, is this the password? Can I get it now? <laughs> and, the and then the server has to check and reply yes or no. And so you would send request after request. But um, doing it that way, you are first limited by the network bandwidth and then by the resources or the speed of your computer, um, but most of all, the speed of the uh, server that you're asking. And yes. the server can easily put a cooldown in place. So I don't know, after... Um, asking um, for five times um, without success, the server could maybe um, cool you down for five minutes and then you're not allowed to uh, enter another password. And so this um, yeah, active or online tracking could take uh, a lot longer. So that's, that's a cool thing about offline uh, attacks. But I guess we will see both a bit here. Yeah, yeah. So the, the point then being, if you and I, Stefan, were to integrate both into an ESP-based game, so first there's an access point they have to gain access to, and then once they're in, they have to do a totally different type of cracking attack, I think it's really cool because one of them is obviously going to be faster if you can throw resources at it. If you just get like an AWS instance that has, you know, a, a really nice attached mm -hmm. GPU, then you can throw so many passwords at this so quickly as soon as you grab the hash that you could probably get into this in seconds, provided the password isn't super long and complicated. 
replicated. But that's not true with an online attack. With an online attack, as soon as you saturate you know, the number of connections that the server can accept and reply to, that, that's the speed that you are able to crack at because you have to wait on the server to reply and decide to let you in or not. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it's interesting because one of them is, for one, much more likely to get you caught because active or online attacks uh, require you to be actively connected to and querying the server you're trying to break into. And then you know, passive attacks or offline attacks you can listen in on somebody joining the network, grab that hash, and crack it offline, and nobody would ever know that you're attacking the network because you haven't emitted a single radio signal. So um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so okay, so let's in, go in ahead. This context, oh. it, so it, to, to, sorry to interrupt you. In this context, it would mean offline cracking um, the WPA2 uh, password of the of the network, mm -hmm. and then once you're in the network, you would try to um, get access to a FTP server, for example. And that would require you to actively ask and, and try out different passwords. Yes, right? exactly. Yep. Yeah. OK, so let's go ahead and switch back over to my screen, which is, ah, oh, yes, it's still updating. Good. So I have opened up Arduino IDE, and I have the example sketch open. And it seems very small. So I'm going to go into Preferences, and I'm going to try to make the font bigger. Uh, but let's see, editor font size. 20. Yeah? OK, cool. All right, so um, this is the basic sketch. So if you want to get here, then what you need to do <laughs> is a series of things that I'll go through relatively quickly. You'll need to download Arduino IDE for your platform, install it, open it up, and then go into Preferences. Again, I should have stayed. And then go to Additional Board Manager URL. And you'll need to drop in the ESP8266 uh, JSON link here. Now, you can find this very easily by uh, just typing add ESP8266 to Arduino into Google. Um, it'll have this JSON uh, URL, or you can just go ahead and pause the video and just take a look at it and copy and paste it. Let me, ah, there you go. That's the full URL <laughs> right there. Um, but yeah, so once you add this to the additional board manager URL, you can press OK, uh, apply, and then you should be able to work with the ESP8266 but you will need to go into File. Um, is it File? No, it's probably Sketch. Include Library, and then Manage Libraries. And then when you're in here, um, you'll need to, within the Library Manager, first let it update your list of installed libraries. And then, let's see. This can take a while. It's super annoying sometimes. Oh, yeah. So I'll type in, um, oh, wait, what? what is it? It's, ESP Canary? Uh, yeah, it's ESP Canary. I'm just going to type in Canary and see if it just grabs that. Hey, cool. ESP Canary. Uh, and you'll just click Install. Now, I've already installed it. But once this is installed, you should be able to uh, have this be one of the libraries featured in the Sketch section. Where is it Sketch? Where's the defaults? Oh uh, no, under File, and then Examples. So this is really cool because it will have examples for all the different boards that you've installed. Uh, so this is really great for getting started if you've never done programming for this particular board before because they'll have all these examples. And then uh, Examples for Custom Libraries, ESP Canary, Simple Honeypot. Now I believe, uh, Stefan, correct me if I'm wrong, I still have to install the device, right, if I was doing this from scratch? Like, I'd have to install the D1 Mini and stuff and such from the board yeah, manager? Yeah, you would have to go into the board's manager, look for ESP8266, and yep, then yep. install that package. OK, so all right, noob. You still got to go in here, go to board, uh, board's manager. And then in order to see all the, or rather, in order to write to these boards, we'll need to uh, wait for it to download the platforms index and then type ESP8266. And we're looking for the, uh, oh, look, it's Stefan's. Well, we don't, sorry, Stefan, we don't need yours for this particular project. You want to install the ESP8266 by community. And this includes all of these different boards, like the D1 Mini, which we'll be using, that will uh, allow Arduino to make, uh, oh, we'll compile software for these boards. So uh, I have already installed this, but go ahead and just, uh, oh, Look at that. I can update it, and maybe it won't work anymore. Um, why did I do that on the stream? All right, cool. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and, and cancel. Will it let me? Please cancel. 
please, please cancel. No, it can't be canceled. I'm just going to close it. OK, cool. Um, all right, so at this point, let's say that I've installed uh, the ESP8266 boards. I can go into Tools, uh, Board, and then select the Lolan Wemos D1 Mini. That's the board that we're going to be using today. Uh, you could buy these really cheap online. Uh, on AliExpress, they're like $3. Um, and of course, if you have a Andromeda deauthor, I believe you could probably just plug it in and use it to try this project too, right? Uh, yeah, because that's also an ESP8266, um, and yeah, there should be no problem. I mean, we don't use any external stuff here, right? We are just nope. flashing the ESP, and yeah, then yeah, sure, you can use you can use anything that has an ESP8266. <laughs> yeah, like also like a Node and MCU or whatever else. So. Um, yeah, so again, this is going to turn it turn it into a dedicated honeypot. It's just going to sit on your network, and it is going to wait for somebody to try to connect to it. Um, so I actually wasn't using, I wasn't cracking uh, at all before. But do I have Hydra on this MacBook Pro? I don't even know. Let me try it. I'm going to do brew install Hydra. By the way, if you have a, Mac a MacBook Pro and you don't use Homebrew, then there's like barely a point. Um, a lot of really great <laughs> Linux uh, Linux agree. tools, like yeah, a lot of really great Linux tools exist for MacBook Pro and ha and have been ported over. And you can just like right now, I'm downloading a password cracking program right onto my MacBook Pro from the command line with like three words. So I have to say, I'm really a fan of the Homebrew project, and I really appreciate that you can get a MacBook Pro. Uh, to act like a Linux computer, to shape up and act like the Linux computer it, it can be when it's in a good mood um, by having the kind of missing package manager for Mac OS. So, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm weaponizing. I'm getting ready to attack here. And once we have this up and running, I'm going to try to do brute forcing on this, although I have not actually tested this. So we're doing it live. Hydra dash dash help. Um, it's just... A legal operation. Are you? You know what I mean. Okay, and then it gives me <laughs> gives me example. So we can see the first default example is for FTP. So so that's great. We can actually try to use Hydra um, for that. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we need to do. So if we go again into file and then uh, examples. Go to the ESP Canary and click on Simple Honeypot. It'll open this. And you can see there are some uh, default uh, variables that are plugged in here that we need to change. So first up, we need to have our Wi-Fi network for this to connect to. So um, I'm going to go ahead on my phone and create a hotspot so we can avoid Michael having to blur anything. And uh, I'm going to change the name of that. Um, OK. That was not a sorry. That was not a network name I could share. All right, so now it's testnet, nice and neutral. Um, man, I must have been really angry when I made that last network name. So, <laughs> all right, so testnet is going to be our SSID. Our password is going to be password one two three. So this is the Wi-Fi. Um, network SSID and the Wi-Fi network password. This will allow the device to join now my phone's hotspot, which I'll turn on. And we should then be able to uh, get internet access on our ESP8266. Now we have paste canary token here. So actually, you'll be interested to know, Stefan, that we don't need to use a canary token. We could also use Joel's project if we wanted to. Oh, Gravify, yeah. Gravify. Yeah, so if you prefer Grabify over Canary Token, then you can actually go ahead and use that. Um, uh, let's see. I'll just make a new Canary Token. I thought I had one up. I'm sure I do, actually. I must have closed it. No, it's it's here. It's here. All right, so here we go. Uh, so on canarytokens.org slash generate, or you can just go to canarytokens.org, and it will redirect you here. Um, you can go and select the web bug URL token. That's the first one. And there's lots of tokens. Some of them, like the DNS token, are very sneaky and uh, easy to use. Um, but we're going to do the web bug URL token. And then we need an email address that is going to report back. So this is where we're going to be looking for the alerts. Um, and in this case, I've, I'm just using my, my backup email address. Um, and I do not monitor this, so don't email me there. <clears throat> so next up, we're going to do um, the uh, string that we want to attach to it. Because if, uh, if we just get a canary token that's like, alert, 
It's like, alert what? Like, what, what is this? So we should be very specific here what this canary token is for, especially if you're going to be using multiple canary tokens. It gets confusing very quickly. So for this one, I'm saying testing FTP attack underway. And I'll click on create my canary token. All right, so now my web token is active. I have this URL. And if I go to this URL, it is going to um, immediately, actually, now that I remind myself, um, tell me which IP address I came from and also the IP address of the network that it triggered on. So um, I'm going to attempt to tunnel my connection through Washington now. So hopefully, when we actually do this, it's not leaking my real IP address that needs to be blurred. And it is, in fact, leaking something from Washington instead, a VPN. So all right, so we now have our web token. We're going to go back to Arduino IDE. We're going to drop this little sucker in here. And uh, boom, there we go. And now we need a, uh, a username and a password. Although, if we want to just detect anybody attempting to log into the FTP server, we do not need to do this. So if we just wanted to make this a simple uh, game where the flag is being the first one to reach the canary token, we don't need to have any cracking whatsoever. We can just set each one of these as the percentage sign, and it will accept any string. So if we want to make this a fast game that like doesn't involve a bunch of cracking and stuff, then like this is the easiest way to do that. And you can have people just you know uh, like attempt to log in, and as soon as they do, boom, they win the game. And we can verify who won the game because this canary token should immediately transmit the IP address of the winning person, and you can just check the timestamp to see who got there first. So insofar, like I know Stefan and I have have uh, had like a bunch of NeoPixels, and we've had LEDs, and like all these other ways to like like let let someone know that the game has been won. But sending like an email alert like this that's automatically triggered when somebody does something that you would have to hack the Wi-Fi in order to do in the first place, like that's a pretty easy way of knowing which team uh, won the game in this case. So all right, so we put in uh, this. And I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to say the most um, common uh, like default password that I've seen is actually admin admin. So I'm going to set it as admin admin. Um, and yeah. I think that that's pretty much all I need to do. So I'm going to take my ESP8266. I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to plug this into my computer. And um, if I press Command-Shift-M, it should give me, oh, board at null is not available. Well, it looks like I haven't selected a port. So I need to go down here, select port. And then I'm going to go to USB serial port. So it should now be connected. And I'm going to go ahead and just upload this um, because I've changed the password and stuff. So all right, let's go ahead and upload. So yeah, the firmware that's running on it right now probably won't work because it won't be able to connect to Wi-Fi. But as soon as it uploads, then it should be able to. So I'll pull this up so you guys can see the progress. It's currently compiling the sketch. But pretty soon, it'll run a bunch of code and then upload it to the ESP8266. Gosh, I wish that I could just do this through a browser. That would be so much easier, right? Ah, oh, man. If only that was possible. Yeah. All right, so we have this updating. Looks like it's now done. So I can press Command Shift M in order to open a serial terminal. And I happen to know that the baud rate is 115200, so I'm going to change it. Um, and if you, if I didn't know that, I could just go back to the program and look around to see when the serial dot begin. I think command starts. Is that is that right? Yeah. Let's see. Um, serial dot begin, and this will tell us what the baud rate is in order for us to communicate with the board or at least monitor it. So here, I'm going to go ahead and press the reset button, so it'll reboot. And now that we know the correct baud rate, we should be able to watch it do its thing. That still doesn't. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So it did a little bit of gibberish, but now we can see, um, boom, it's connected. It has an IP address. It has a MAC address. And the spiffs are open. Isn't that great news, Stefan? Yeah, that's great. There's, uh, You don't want the spiffs not to be open. This is <laughs> always a terrible sign if something's corrupted there. The spiffs is basically the um, uh, file system that's running on the memory in, inside the ESP. That's super useful if you're, for example, running an FTP server like we are. Uh, doing now, because then you can use that internal memory for storing files. Exactly. So actually, there's a way for us to upload like dummy files to this to make it look even more like it's a real file server. And they will be read only. 
but the attacker actually can connect and try to download those files and see that there are files on the server. So uh, it's a pretty funny way of, of just, uh, uh, I don't know, taking it a step further because you could even have a document on that FTP server that has its own canary token in it. So when you open that file, it immediately beacons out to like the DNS canary token or something like that. So you can put like layers upon layers where if someone breaks into your you know dummy FTP server and downloads it, maybe when they download the file and up and open it, it'll be opened on their own computer and you'll be able to get the user agent, which would give you a lot more information about who's like around in your computer and uh, you know what they're trying to do. So, all right, so we can see the spits are open. We have a MAC address, we have an IP address. So this allows us to now uh, begin doing our thing. So I'm gonna go, let's see, where's my email? Um, it's not there. That's my K-pop collection. There we go, all right. So <laughs> I, have, I have filtered for uh, Canary tokens and we can see we got a Canary token triggered earlier today, but nope, that's not what we're doing right now. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna do uh, should we do Hydra? Do you want to try it? Yeah, that sounds fun. Okay, so I'm going to nano um, uh, pass list dot text, so I can literally use this exact example right here um, because <laughs> I'm lazy. Nano pass list dot text. You have to change then, your IP address. Uh, that, that's later. What? Don't be confused. Don't be yeah. confused. Oh, go yeah, on, yeah, okay. go on. Uh, you're right. So then I'm just going to like type in a couple passwords. So password, password123. We're just, you know, fact simulating a, a list of passwords. My pass, my big pass. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, admin, a wait. Admin, admin. And then finally, admin. So we're not going to be cracking that much, but pretend this is, you know, you guys don't want to be here for days. Like, let's just try to save this. Because I feel like it's going to actually force me to sudo this because I'm doing it in the root directory. Let's try it. No, it, it let me do it. So I'm going to just make sure it's saved correctly. Uh, cat pass, passlist.txt. There we go. All right, so we have a bunch of passwords here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use this Hydra example. But first, let me go ahead and connect to the network we will be attacking. So I'm going to switch over to another network. It's going to be testnet. And the password is password123. So as soon as we're here, I'm going to start looking around. In fact, I'll make this a bit bigger for you guys. Oops. OK, so that's fun. Uh, so it turns out when I join my phone's network, that also makes it so, um, you know, I stop broadcasting to Stefan. So, all right, so hopefully you guys can see this infinite, uh, this infinite wall of nothing. Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, so here we go. We're now on the same network that we're attacking and also going through a VPN, which is great for my network speed. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to do an ARP scan. Let's see if that works. OK. And uh, it says one host responded. And we can see there's uh, an IP address here, 192.168.224.152. So let's see. Is that us? I can confirm this by looking at the monitor. So we're 189. So all right, so we'll need to do a little bit more probing. So if we want to find this, we can use the general network range. And I'm going to do an nmap scan. So I'm going to do sudo nmap um, this network range, so 0, 24. But I'm going to specify dash dash open. So I only get results that are open. So I'm bas just basically looking for any open port on this whole network that I'm connected to. Um, yeah, yep. And uh, I've set this up now so that hopefully we're running through a VPN. So when this triggers, it's going to be running through like Seattle, Washington or something, which is totally where I live. So this Nmap scan will take a little bit because it's going through every possible IP address on this network range. But once it comes back, I'm hoping that we will see um, port, well, 21, I believe. All right, so continuing to do this Nmap scan, still waiting. But on my phone, I can see that there's two devices. 
and I can now see that there's an FTP service that's telling me it's a Synology device. So Synology is uh, something that I would expect to see for like a network attached storage or something. So we're going to go ahead and use this for the IP address that we're attacking. So we've successfully discovered what this is. So I'm going to go back and use hydra-help again. I now have this IP address to attack. And I'm just going to take this right here and paste it at the front. So we are also going to change the, instead of L user, we're going to do admin. And we're going to run the attack and also allow it. Thank you, Patrick Wardle, for that tool to prevent random programs for, from connecting to the network. So it's going to go through a couple different attempts. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to uh, actually log in correctly. Let's see. Zero pass valid passwords found. OK, so looks like Hydra had a hard time with that. Instead, we can just use FTP to connect to this. And I'll go ahead and do this so we can connect back to the normal network and Stefan can hear me normally again. Uh, so we can see, all right, so Hydra is not currently working on this. Let's go ahead instead. Uh, we're just going to FTP right here. It's asking for our name. So we're going to say admin. And it's going to ask for our password. We're going to say uh, admin. And we get a timeout. So let's try it one more time. OK, and it says FTP OK. Over here, we see our Canary token is fired. And I'm going to switch back over to the other network. OK, we are now back on the other network. Stefan, welcome back. Oh my god, you sound so much better now. <laughs> yeah, I, I figure. So hopefully, um, we were getting some audio through the microphone I have in front of me and not through the network, because otherwise, uh, you guys probably couldn't hear me either. But um, if you could hear me, then this is what happened. We successfully connected to the network. We then went ahead and ran Nmap. And what Nmap did was it scanned the entire network, and it found this. It found uh, what looked like a Synology incorporated device, and uh, the actual port was open on port 21, which is the standard port for FTP. So that looked really good. Uh, we can see there was also, you know, the uh, there was a domain service open, but that's not really as exciting. So as an attacker, we would probably go after the Synology device. And that was just um, running, uh, what was it, sudo nmap, uh, and then just the entire network range here looking for open ports. So all right, at the I tried to do um, a, a Hydra attack on this, and it was just not happening. I, I do not know why it was not happening, but it was just not happening. So uh, overall, I found that we might need to do a little bit more work before Hydra works on it. But when I just logged in with the default credentials admin admin, I got this result uh, in Arduino IDE. So over here, I can see um, connection made from 192.168.224.36, uh, attempted canary. Ooh. Um, connecting to Canary tokens, posting JSON, and then um, IP, uh, and it's just kind of repeating the IP address that made the connection. So let's go see if I got properly alerted. If I go over here um, and I run my search again for Canary tokens, then hopefully, hopefully I get something. Life demos, man. Oh, wait. Um, well, whatever. I also have. I can also manage this token from here. Uh, so let's see. Oh, the token hasn't been triggered yet. What does that mean? Um, so it says that. Wait, it says that it was triggered. Like it just says connecting to. Although it doesn't confirm. Although it does say it posted JSON. So uh, well, that's interesting. Well, let's take a Try look. Again. Um, you want me to try again? Try again. Uh, sure. That sounds like fun. All right, let me switch over to the other network. Oh, oh God, oh, God, maybe not. Cool, all right, we're back. So now I'm looking, uh, so I did it a second time. I just reran the code. And we see IP connection, connection made from so-and-so, attempted canary posting. And then it, it basically gave me the same message as before. But this time, it actually was triggered. Why was the difference this time? I don't know. 
But we can see your token has been triggered once. We can click view its history. And we can see, um, oh, I think I'm like disallowing JavaScript on this or something. But uh, we can see that it thinks I'm in Seattle, Washington. That's great. I don't know why it didn't load correctly, but I don't care now. Uh, and we can see uh, it was from Washington. We can see it was from T-Mobile USA. Um, it's not a known Tor exit node. And we can see there's a memo telling us what it was, a uh, testing uh, attack underway. And the user agent, um, which is a flexible variable, you can kind of put whatever you want in, is reading out to be the IP address of the attacker. So that's really useful. That, that lets us know both the location of the network that's under attack and then also the IP address of the attacker. So I, as a defender, could go back and look for who is doing it. And now I can see that, there we go, I got a Canary token in my email address that's telling me uh, that something has happened. So cool. All right. Um, everything has worked. Um, if, uh, if it was a little bit unexpected how bad the, the network was. Uh, all right. So Stefan, what do you think? Pretty cool way of being able to uh, trigger a honeypot on your, on your home network, huh? Yeah. I mean, maybe we can iterate on the whole thing a bit more. Like, what the end your video is gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Come back. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. I'm just making sure that I'm not talking into the void. Oh I yeah, mean, sorry. You were you were a robot voice for a second, but you're better now. Okay, yeah, you I couldn't see you. Um anyway, I mean, it's it's pretty cool. I mean we have like a two dollar device um just powered through USB. Um, that's sitting in our network. I mean, this is super versatile because you could take this and, and place it in, in any network without really any work. You don't, you know, you can power this with any USB uh, connection. And um, given you've configured it before, uh, it will, uh, you have a honeypot in your network. And if something is going on, you are alerted by email. I mean, that's, that's super cool. I mean, that's, um, you set this up once, and it's it's super cheap, and um, doesn't really draw power or doesn't need any maintenance. Yeah, it it makes a simple task um, very convenient. Yeah, I would say so as well. So, I mean, as you can see, the the setup here is very very simple to deploy, and it does react uh, properly to being logged into. Sometimes it might take like when you first set it up a login or two to make sure that it's working normally. But I found that it's a really low cost way that you can put a little bit of security layering onto your network and detect when somebody is poking around where they shouldn't be. And as I mentioned, you can also set it up so anybody connecting with any password triggers it. So if you want to catch, I don't know, one of your roommates trying to log in or something, you can be like, I can see what password you tried to use. So um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty funny that uh, it doesn't take much to get this like set up on your network when a lot of people think you need to like a whole like industrial like monitoring system. I mean, you know, really security is at, is at its best when there's different layers. And this, assuming someone breaks into your network and they're already inside looking for juicy stuff, like I think this is one of the easiest ways you can make sure that this is the first thing they go after and not something you might care about a lot more. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is just great because it's so uh, simple and cheap to deploy, e even much cheaper and simpler than a Raspberry Pi. Mm. Yeah, and of course, if you do already have a Raspberry Pi and you want a Raspberry Pi-based project, there's another version of this you can run on a Raspberry Pi that comes with a bit more power and customization abilities, and you can check that out on another maker's uh, YouTube channel, although we'll probably end up featuring it on this channel as well at some point. So. Yeah, I think that's all we have for today. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for joining us. And uh, yeah, hopefully, we'll be able to maybe use this library in one of our future projects to make hacking games even more fun for the people that are trying to learn uh, about cybersecurity. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> all right, thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. And uh, yeah, until then, bye.